Yeah, so aortic stenosis, of course, is a disease when you have severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, it kills you. There is no medical therapy. The only therapy is to replace your aortic valve. Up until recently, the only option was surgery. And now we have transcatheortic valve replacement. We tested in people that were high risk for surgery, and it was as good as surgery. That's 8% of the population currently being operated on in the U.S. We tested intermediate risk patients. That's 12% of the population. It's been approved there. This trial is testing TAVR against surgery in a low risk population. That is the remaining 80% of the population that you'll see in your office with severe aortic stenosis. So the outcome of this trial is not just going to shift us a little bit, but if it's positive, it would be a seismic shift in what we can offer our patients. So what we did is we, we, we tested the self-expanding superannular valve, which is the core valve evolute family of valves, against surgery. Surgeons were allowed to choose any valve they wanted as long as it was a biologic valve. This trial had a few first generation valves, core valve 31, about three quarters second generation valve Evolute R, and 22.3% third generation Evolute Pro. Now that's important because the other trial that we saw today, which was a stunningly good trial, was all third generation valves, and we're just getting there with this. What the, the primary endpoint of the trial was all-cause mortality or disabling stroke at two years. Now we did this with a Bayesian analysis. Bayesian analysis lets us, when we have 850 people at one year, actually have a predictive model that moves everybody forward to two years. I don't want to get into Bayesian unless you're interested, but it gives us a good endpoint. It's been validated over and over again. So the endpoint of all-cause mortality or disabling stroke for surgery was 6.7%. For TAVR, it's 5.3%. That gives us a difference of 1.4%. We used an absolute 6% non-inferiority margin, which gives us a posterior probability curve that's greater than 0.999. Now, for those of you that need p-values, if you subtract that from one, you get a p-value of less than 0.0001 as a good approximation. We do a lot of sensitivity analysis, and in every sensitivity analysis, TAVR maintained its non-inferiority. Now, we had seven powered hierarchical endpoints. For one year, it was effective orifice area, mean gradient, change in NYHA classification, and change in your KCCQ uh, summary quality of life score. If all those pass since they're hierarchical, we then go down to superiority, and we have effective orifice area, mean gradient one year, and KCCQ at one month. All those passed, which meant that at one year, TAVR was uh, significantly better than surgery for effective orifice area, for mean gradient, and for return of quality of life at 30 days. Now we had a, a variety of other endpoints that we looked at. One was a, uh, a composite safety, which included you know, mortality and stroke and atrial fibrillation and bleeding and kidney injury. And at 30 days, TAVR was superior for that. And it was also superior for subcomponents of stroke, bleeding, and kidney injury. It was superior for atrial fibrillation. And it was superior for, uh, for hospitalization. The only thing that surgery won at, one, at 30 days was, was pacemakers. There were more pacemakers in uh, the TAVR group than the surgical group. If you go to one year, TAVR is now superior for stroke, disabling stroke, and for hospitalization. So what that, the other thing we could do is we have enough patients, that was 1,400 patients that we an analyzed there. We have over 800 at one year, so we can do standard frequency Kaplan-Meier curves. So at one year, the, the mortality for TAVR was 2.3% and surgery was 3%. Really low. At 30 days, in fact, it was 0.7 for TAVR and 1.2 for surgery. Very good in both groups. Uh, amazingly low. Then if you move to disabling stroke, doing a kaplan meier one year, it was 0.7 for TAVR and I think 2.1 for surgery. So that was significantly uh, in favor of TAVR, uh, statistically significant. Now, we also didn't allow a bolic protection device, and we still had this amazingly low stroke rate, less than 1% a year. Then we also looked at hospitalization. And at one year, 3.1% of the TAVR patients got hospitalized, and 63 of the surgical patients. Again, this was significant for TAVR as another win. So the other trial we saw, the PARTNER trial, which was a stunningly good trial with really good results, used an endpoint of all-cause mortality, disabling stroke, or hospitalization. If we use our endpoint of all-cause mortality, disabling stroke, or hospitalization, we actually turn out significant for TAVR to a rank level of 0.002. It's 10.4 one year for surgery, 5.3 for TAVR. So the conclusion of this trial is that we meet our primary endpoint at two years of all-cause mortality disabling stroke of non-inferiority. We're safer at 30 days, less death, less stroke. By the way, you get out of the hospital in half the time of surgery and your quality of life improves faster. Whereas surgery had a little, a fewer pacemakers and a little less aortic regurgitation, but we only had 
22.3% of our third generation valve, which was actually designed to reduce that. I think we'll do better as we move forward. And the pacemakers are already coming down. My trial, my site's personal pacemaker rate was 5.6%. There are tricks to keep it down. At one year, uh, both of them had excellent survival, but Taver had less strokes and less hospitalization. And it also had, at every single time point, superior hemodynamics to surgery. And we've seen this in every trial of the self-expanding valve. They perform better than surgical valves. The, the effective orifice area, how big the valve gets, is bigger than surgery at every time point. The mean gradient, lower than surgery at every single time point. Now we think this is important as we move into the lower risk population because they're going to be more active. And we know from flow dynamics that until you get an effective orifice area of two, it's hard to increase your flow without increasing your gradient significantly. And, and TAVR had an effective orifice area of 2.2. What that means is that you're down my low risk group and you get a TAVR and you want to go out and run, you can do that. You can be more active. And we think that that's going to have, have, have an impact in your functional recovery, maybe your quality of life, and maybe even your longevity. So this is a very positive trial. It used to be, as, as we were going through this, we thought that maybe TAVR would be an alternative to surgery in low risk. This data tells you that TAVR is probably the preferred therapy in the group of patients we tested. And when I talk to patients in my office now that come in with aortic stenosis and they're a candidate for a biologic surgical valve because of age and other criteria, if I don't talk to them about TAVR, I have not given them really true informed consent. We're not doing true shared decision making.